So people, they are coming in now. How many are we expecting? 22. Okay, I think I'll just start now. Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar about future drone applications in maritime. My name is Tia Skytte-Pedersen and I'm from MALAG, which is Denmark's new cluster organization of maritime logistics. I'll be the host of today's webinar and I'm happy to present our speaker who is Matt Spaniel, who is a postdoctoral researcher at Aarhus University. And actually, this is not the first time we have had uh, Matt in the studio. He was uh, presenting a tidbit a few months ago. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll put up a link in, in the chat just uh, in a minute so you can uh, check it out afterwards. And um, this is a follow up on his uh, tidbit and it will be all about aerial drones and not so much on robots actually. And uh, I'll help passing over your questions to Matt so after his presentation, you can uh, put, ask all your questions you want and I'll pass them over to Matt. So feel free to ask whatever you like to in the chat or in the Q&A option uh, in the bottom of this uh, Zoom screen. So Matt, he will give his uh, theoretical uh, take on how the future drone and robotic applications located at shipyards, on board ships and at ports will look like. And uh, with a look at today's participant list, I can see that there's different entry angles and interests on drones. So I'm looking much forward to your questions uh, for Matt in the end. So, uh, but for now, I just hope that you lean back and enjoy. And uh, Matt, it's all yours. Super. Uh, thank you, Tia, for that introduction. Hi, everybody. My name is Matthew Spaniel, or Matt Spaniel. Um, and I'm here to talk about future drone applications in Maritime. So there were some requests out of the last tidbit if we could kind of focus on this general area. And I, I said I'd be happy to. Um, this is such a deep and interesting topic, though. Um, and if you if you looked at, you could do the same thing for robots. So what we're doing today, it's kind of, kind of split it up, right? Because there's uh, I think some benefits for doing this kind of in depth and, and, and in depth as we can go about the future, I would say. So uh, again, uh, I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Aarhus. Um, I've been working inside of maritime and the ocean economies for about a decade now, originally from the United States. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be here. If we go back to what we talked about in the last tidbit, I, I mentioned the, the periscope innovation radar, right? Inside this radar, we've identified about 115 technologies or innovations that are gonna have an impact on the maritime and ocean economies over the forthcoming decades, right? And we've built these into what we would call a foresight radar. And now about 10% of these have something to do with drones, uh, aerial drones, right? We've got a number on subsea drones and subsea drones, and we've got a number on robotics, but today let's just focus on the aerial drones, right? So in our innovation radar or our foresight radar, yeah, we've got uh, something of one axis that's available, right? It's this axis that's about time. So these are all forecasts now. So we've got 2020. So a lot of these forecasts were established in November of last year. And every time you go out one ring, right, you'll see that that's one year, right? So we've got a 2035 horizon, but you'll see that there's a ton of activity happening about on this five-year horizon. And that's actually where we find a lot of our aerial drone applications taking shape. Right, so the question that we ask to, uh, to establish these forecasts is when will these applications become commercially available or accepted practice inside of maritime and offshore? I'm gonna go back into the, I'm gonna come back to that a little bit um, as we discuss about the methods and the construction of this radar. Um, we've got some really cool partners. This is an Interreg North Sea project uh, based in uh, the, the Northern European region, right? So we've got partners in Sweden and Norway and, and uh, Netherlands and the UK and Denmark and Germany. Um, so again, this foresight radar, each of these little blips on the radar, you might call them, is essentially an innovation, right? Which means that there's a technology with a specific capability 
right, that we're asking when it's going to happen. So there's a current practice or no practice at all, right? And we're saying that this technology is going to have a change in the way that things and work and tasks are done in the future. So each of these blips, you could think about it as representing uh, technology development projects. Right, And in order to build uh, this radar, and especially what we did with drones, we used a, a two-step process. The first is what we call morphological analysis. And I'm going to touch on this uh, a little bit in, in a minute. And the second one is innovation forecasting, which you might go back to the other tidbit where I talked a little bit more in depth, but we're going to breeze right through those here real quickly. So. Morphological analysis asks us to define the landscape of the space of which the concepts of the technology can be developed. Okay, so we're trying to look at, we're not looking at aerial drones as specifically quadcopters necessarily, but we're looking at a large range of different, uh, say, uh, variables that go into the design of the product, right, being that aerial drone. And so let's go through these real quick. So we've got, let's say, applications uh, for the market as being a first step, right? So what is it that aerial drones are known to be able to do, right? They're able to do surveillance, right? That's a little bit different from surveying and mapping because surveying and mapping are going to say that, look, a survey or a map is something that needs uh, to be done once and essentially it's completed. Surveillance is when you watch a boundary, right? When something crosses over a specific threshold, right? So there's this ongoing kind of monitoring of that. There's also the third one here is monitoring and inspection, but think of that as say uh, infrastructure monitoring or in these are periodic, often one-off or uh, say, uh, events where you go in with a specific purpose to do this kind of inspection or monitoring to check, for example, on, on the level of uh, infrastructure decay. All right, we've got uh, aerial drones in transportation, right, moving goods uh, over uh, time and space. We've got uh, emerging uses in emergency and in disaster responses for aerial drones we are seeing the emergence of the ability of aerial drones to do some sorts of physical assembly, right? And that's also very closely connected to the transportation of goods, right? But we're saying that, look, we're actually gonna be able to perform a task with these drones. And then we have the capability to do what we would say ongoing connectivity. So it's providing some kind of infrastructure link, right? It might be an uplink for communicative or uh, internet-based uh, uh, connectivity. And then we look at the propulsion, right? So let's look at how these drones are moving, right? We're saying that the dominant thing that comes to our mind when we're thinking about drones or aerial drones is the rotorcraft craft, or often a quad or an octocopter, right? But there are some other drones that are starting to emerge. Let's say the ones that have the flapping wings that might represent insects or might mimic birds, right? We've also got uh, jets or fixed jets and turbines, right, on uh, aerial drones, right? And we've got uh, water jets. Maybe you've seen some of these recreational ones that uh, kind of shoot water down and propulse uh, a, a tourist up into the air. We've got gliding drones, right, that are using, say, thermal uh, updrafts to raise that drone above the ground. And we've got also balloons. If we think about the energy source, Right? The dominant thought that we might have is that there's an electrical storage uh, on board. Often that will be in the form of a battery. We've also got uh, the ability to power these drones by solar, wind, and hydrogen. Hydrogen, you could think of that as some kind of alternative fuel storage apart from electrical. Right? We can also think of drones as having tethered by a cable right? in which that it's got a continuous power source that's uh, located uh, on another vessel or another, uh, say, uh, vehicle or even the ground. And then we've got uh, plenty of drones out there in operation with combustion engines. When we think about how fast these drones can go, right, we're thinking about, we've, we've decided to cut it into three basic zones, right, a low, medium, and a high. So is the drone able to uh, fly up to five kilometers, we would call that low. And if it's going over 200 kilometers an hour, that's going to be a high speed, right? And then we talk about uh, max flight distance. So how far can the drone travel, right? So 
if the drone's going straight up, we call that a vertical drone, right? Think of a, a tethered drone might be something like that where it would have a limitation by a cable, right? Where it's going straight up from the ground. Other uh, drones, we would say it's a low flight uh, radius if it's going under five kilometers, and then a high flight radius if it's able to go over 200 kilometers, right? And then how much can it carry? So what's its carrying capacity? We've got a low and a high again, low being under 25 kilos and high being above uh, 200 kilos. So that essentially gives us our landscape. So what morphological analysis does now is it allows us to think through the different uh, uh, um, say designs of these different drones. And so what we do is we use what we would call a cross consistency analysis. So in this, we rate how well this, op this particular variable pairs with every other variable outside of its own category and across uh, all of the different segments. And that gives us this cross consistency analysis. So we're rating these things based on, you know, how well do these two pair together? Is there a logical reason that we should find these together? Is there empirical evidence that we've already seen these things together? And in which cases we would rate them high. If it's not likely that they're gonna be rated high, then we, we lower down uh, the, that rating, right? And that gives us what we would say a lower consistency. So what we do then is we create a whole bunch of different options about these designs and how these drones might look, right? And in, in essence, with all of these boxes, we've got over 9,000 different capabilities, right? Possibilities for different uh, connections. What we did in Periscope was we, we identified the top 24 as being ones that are particularly interesting, but maybe understudied, right? But now when we go back to what we do in maritime, you'll see that a lot of the, the dominant formats that we do see are ended up being in this, this quadcopter space. But we tried, we tried to look broader and bigger. Um, <clears throat> easier said than done though. Um, and then what we do then is we try to pair each of those uh, top 24 with a potential use case. So how could that design and what could that design be used for, right? And we ended up with about 125 uh, different designs uh, matched up with different kinds of use cases, right? And then we rated them, right? And we said, okay, what are the top use cases that we're looking at, right? And we come up with a list. Now, not everything on this list, uh, right? So we're rating them on how feasible are they and are they desirable and is there a market? So you'll see in Periscope that we often take a, a, a strong focus on commercial applications, less so on military applications or, or public sector applications for that matter. So that was morphological analysis, what we did to find our concepts and our use cases. And now we want to forecast, when, when do we think that these different use cases are going to be implemented inside of maritime and offshore economies? Now, innovation forecasting is a bit of a tricky uh, element because there's really no historical or even present data from which you can extrapolate. Right, so you've got a concept and you're trying to figure out when will it happen in the future, right? And that creates a bit of a different uh, way of doing forecasting. If you think about the typical technology diffusion curve, right, you'll have, say, your first sale right around here. And as that kind of integrates into the market, it goes up and then it's kind of reaching, say, the early majority and then the late majority until the laggards pick it up at the end, right? This S curve, S -curve is uh, identifiable in the, in the dissemination of many prod products and uh, in many different markets, right? But when we're trying to in, when we're trying to forecast innovation, it becomes a bit of a trick, right? So we're looking actually for this what we would call the moment of accepted practice, right? Or the moment of commercial availability, thinking that between now or whenever we have the concepts or even the prototype, as we move along that technology readiness level, right? There is this kind of moment when the market picks it up and it sells, and now it's ready to scale. So we're looking for that moment when we're ready to scale because then we would know essentially how much time do we have between now or the time that the forecast is made and whenever we're expecting to pick this up in the market. Because if we're able to invest early enough, then we're able to return what we would call reserve the right to play, right? Reserve the right to develop these kinds of ideas, right? And we would know then how to time our investments, for example. This is often called in, uh, in, the, in the literature, the, the valley of death of commercialization. So we're trying to forecast how far, how long is that valley of death, right? And then again, time to commercial availability. So how do we do this, right? Um, 
So we use a method called the, the wisdom of the crowds, right? So imagine you walk into a room and there's a jar full of jelly beans and, and there's a big audience coming in and you, you ask the people coming into the room one by one to write down how many jelly beans they think are, are in that jar, right? And they drop it in the jar, right? When we gather up all of those guesses and take a look at what we would call the central tendency information, right? The median and the mean, right? And the standard deviations, we're able to kind of get a grip on, you know, when people think or when the crowd thinks that these different innovations are gonna come uh, into fruition. Now, it doesn't mean that that central tendency information is better than the best guess. However, it is often, almost undeniably, often more reliable than any individual's guess because we would not know which individual's, individual's guess to make. Now, in innovation forecasting, there's an interesting uh, problem because the information that we're using to make these kinds of forecasts, it's distributed across the people's heads in, all, uh, in, in let's say, an in industry. And so there are people with insider information, but what we see is when we ask the people with the insider information to make these forecasts, they're actually aware of their biases. They can tell us if they think that they're being more optimistic or less optimistic than where they think the crowd can be. And we can then calibrate ever so slightly to try to kind of nail that. But what we do find is that the experts are often quite close to those central tendency uh, uh, guesses. So uh, in its essence, this method says that paradoxically, the best way for a group to be smart is for each person to th think and act as independently as possible, which means that they're not able to converse and talk to each other before they have to make that guess, right? They're using right, their own knowledge, right? And relying on their own heuristics to try to make that forecast, right? And when you average them all together, you end up in, in a better place than you would be without it. So, Again, information is key. So now if we said that uh, the net weight of these jelly beans are in the jar is 450 grams, right? All of a sudden we're able to start doing some more processing and calculating. So more information that's available, the more important that uh, we get in these forecasts. And therefore we do ask people then the follow-up question, what's needed to make this happen? So the question that we ask to do this innovation forecasting is to please estimate how many years from now that accomplishing task A by or with technology B will become an accepted practice, commercially available, or a viable alternative to current practice. So that's the structure of the question that you need to ask to try to pull this response out of the people. So we're going to go through a number of these uh, drone op uh, uh, opportunities in here uh, in a little bit. But we'd like to start with um, with with some uh, uh, ways that we're able to calibrate or, or think about this question. So we give people a sliding scale. So we did this in 2020, and they're able to say, I think this is going to happen about here, in which case it would be about 2035. They're also given the opportunity to tell us that they think it's never going to happen. And it's not because it's never going to happen because it's so far infinitely out into the future, but rather there's something else. There's a rival technology or there's some kind of impediment that's in the way of this innovation ever being able to cross that valley of death. The another alternative that respondents were able to make is that it's already here, that they could say that there is empirical evidence, we have data or we have um, knowledge about the implementation of this, that it's already here in practice. So, and we get a lot of that and we'll see those, those popping up again later on. So again, Periscope, uh, we looked at about 325 total uh, innovations, right? And one third of those being in uh, drones with about 115, say, use case concepts that had commercial applications, right? And we use those to build uh, Periscope with our friends in EcoProdigy, lend us, lend us a hand. And it covers all sections of the maritime and the ocean economies from offshore wind to ocean infrastructure, to uh, renewable energy, to uh, uh, applications in ports and in shipyards. So there's uh, quite a large kind of uh, area of innovation that we looked at uh, in this North Sea project. But again, it's a North Sea project, so it's mostly determined uh, by North Sea actors and North Sea in in interests. So that's how we built our radar. Now let's talk a little bit about drones, why we're here. 
that's a big caveat to put in front before we start talking about predictions for the future. But I want you to be with me to understand that these are predictions, right? But they come with a number of caveats about predicting the future. So drones, so what is it that we, we know about drones? We, there are some trends we would say in drone capability development, right? And there's, let's, these are quite important because they kind of shape and frame the way that we think about the, the future of, of drones as we go forward. The first is that they're getting smaller and they're getting lighter. Now, a lot of this development is really coming from the drone racing industry, right? They, these uh, professional, where they have prizes of upwards of in the millions of dollars, right? They're building these drones smaller and lighter in order to fly them faster, right? We've got a lot of development happening around optical navigation and, and segmentation, like we would call that semantic segmentation, right? So where these cameras are able to say, identify different parts of the landscape that they're looking at, right? Not too different from the CAPTCHA type exercise that you do when you're uh, say, proving that you're not a robot. We've also got a lot of development happening in low visibility navigation, nighttime in uh, fog type weather. We've got uh, developments happening on indoor navigation. Now we've got a lot of new 5G technologies coming from the satellite structures that are enabling us not only to look and be more precise, right? We're talking down to the, oh boy, I know I've got experts in the room, how, how many centimeters we're talking about precision on that navigation, but we're also able to talk about how high they are, right? Inside of, uh, in, the, in that kind of dimension. So the GPS where it's two dimensional now we're gonna have a third dimension about height. Right, that'll able, enable us to navigate indoors um, with more with more success, I should say. <clears throat> We've got developments happening in what we would call waypoint or beacon precision landing. I mean, imagine that you could uh, say turn on your cell phone, right, and turn it on and use it as a beacon and ask the drone to land right on the cell phone, right. And as we go forward, we'll see that. Um, dominant thinking today is that these drones are equipped with cameras, but we're starting to implement more and more sensors, right, uh, to measure all sorts of things. And then we're going to be also coupling this with all sorts of different types of equipment to be do all sorts of different types of tasks. So these, um, as they move forward. And then we've got this idea that drones are starting to cooperate with one another. So we're able to then say support drone with drone type of uh, uh, collaborations. So multiple drones performing tasks. And then we've got what we call increasing dexterity, right? Meaning that the drones are able to say more finely manipulate things uh, and maybe even their position, right? So the, the ability to use, let's say torque, for example, right? Is gonna be much more fine as we go forward, right? Which is important for uh, uh, a lot of this equipment add-on because right now, if you think of the dexterity that we have in our fingertips as humans, right? Uh, the development in that space is really moving forward fast. And then we've got some uh, early insights that we've got autonomous center of gravity calibrations, right? So when you take a quadcopter, for example, and you wanna start it up, right? You move it to the side, turn it around, right? And then it's ready to go, right? They're gonna be able to do this uh, essentially by themselves. So that's what we know about trends in drone capabilities. I'd love to hear about the trends that you see and that you know are happening and it, drop them in the comments and maybe we can, can hear about the trends that you see out there. Now we'll talk about some bottlenecks, right? Illustrated by this traffic jam. So what are the things that are kind of getting in the way of the implementation of drones to do tasks in maritime? and beyond maritime for that matter. One is regulation, and this is changing quite quickly, right? The United States just recently opened up a lot of new uh, commercial, uh, uh, say, say, use cases, right? There's a big infrastructure plan coming, and a lot of that's gonna be done with the support of drones that were expected to be done with the support of the front. Same in the EU, right? So for uh, commercial ventures, there are 
they are starting to lax the regulations quite heavily. Now, of course, there are still problems flying over cities where there's lots of people, but maritime being over the water, right? It's thought that there's a lot less danger. You have the danger of losing the drone over the water, but there's no human danger necessarily involved if you're over the water. Now, there are many certain, uh, certainly many uh, uh, regulations that are getting in the way, such as you cannot drop anything into the water from a drone, for example. So that. Every time you're applying for permits and doing work inside of the drone applications, uh, right, you're going to need to go through often a risk uh, analysis together with the ministries of transportation still. Bottlenecks is another bottleneck is human operators. So a lot of development companies spend a lot of time, right, um, developing these products and testing them and testing them again. And when this moment of handover happens, right, to operators who may not have been, may or may not have been more or less involved inside of the testing, right, you're asking less experienced people than to take over the operations of these drones. And we're finding problems there, right? And we, we, see, we lose lots of, uh, of potential use cases in those moments. So another trend might be to think about, okay, we're getting more and more than experienced there. And then we're gonna try to, say reduce the demands on the human operators in the future. So that increasingly means more autonomous type of activity for drones. <clears throat> Another thing that we see uh, kind of, uh, you say it's a bottleneck or not, but we've got kind of two major actors inside the drone development world. We've got small, often individuals operating drones and providing services. And we have large companies, right? There's very few in between there, right? Between the small and the large, right? Because what we see happening is as these drone companies tried to grow and expand, right? They're in these, they're in the situation where they got to cross this valley of death. And if they're not being able to cross that successfully, we're seeing a lot of, lot of drone companies not quite make it Right, um, so there's a lot of push from the bottom to try to grow these companies, right, increase their sophistication, but they're having a hard time really, say, breaking through and breaking out of that uh, that small scale. A technological uh, bottleneck that we have and that we know uh, quite a bit about here at Aarhus University is battery capacity. So we are maximizing the limits of what we can do for batteries. We're hoping for paradigm shift inside of something like this that could really move us to the next level because the longer we can keep those drones in operation, the more work we can do, right? And then the more scalable it is for the value added that we're able to contribute with. So battery capacity seems like we're pushing the boundaries of that limit. And again, we need a breakthrough on that. Another bottleneck that we have with the drones is that they're fragile. They break, they fall, they right, and they require a lot of time and love to keep them right maintained in the right way, right? So we lose often uh, valuable assets that we've spent a lot of time uh, developing, and those prototype types do take a long time to develop, but they still are quite fragile in the end, right? Another bottleneck that we have is this, what we would call the size versus quality issue, right? You can have a big drone with a lot of quality, but if you try to take that drone down to a smaller size, you're kind of losing some of the capabilities that you have with the larger drone. Now that goes a little bit about uh, against what we currently think about in marketing is that you can buy a product, you know, and that product, you can, you can get it fast, you can get it cheap and you can get it high quality but you have the limitation is that you can only choose two of the three, right? How true is this? It's coming out of marketing, right? So you can get something that's fast and cheap, right? But it's gonna have low quality, right? You can get something fast with high quality, but then it's not gonna be cheap, right? Or you can get something that's you know, quite cheap and it's got high quality, but it might take you a long time to get it, right? So, but what does size have to do with this? And this is an open question that I still have and I'm wrestling with when it comes to drones. Right, so what does it mean when we talk about drones in this way, right? Is that primarily a quality type consideration? Because remember, it's about fast and being in terms of the deliverable, right? How fast can you buy that product? It's not talking about how fast the drone can fly, but we're talking about how fast can you get that, right? And a lot of the capabilities that we're building into drones, right? Are these advanced abilities to do these, perform these tasks? So writing the code, for those kinds of joints, it takes a really long time. So nothing comes fast, right, in that world. And it's quite uh, intensive. So it's not cheap, right? 
and the quality is still kind of, so bottlenecks and drones in, in, in a nutshell. And then we've got what we would think about um, additional challenges coming in the maritime and offshore and ocean economies, right? The first one is rust, right? There was a book written of, uh, maybe in 2012 called The Longest War, right? And it, it describes the, the history of the United States military and its battle against oxidation in their equipment, right? And this is what we're finding also in drones, right? Because of over the, 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 the water of the oceans and the seas, right? There's a high saline content there. And so what happens is it, it does impact then the, the innards or the electrical in the, in, in the infrastructure, in the, in the components of the drone. And what happens is we'll see, we've heard stories anyway of drones doing infrastructure uh, inspections, for example, of bridges and they drop basically out of the air. They just, and they're done, right? So they're, so oxidation and rust is a severe challenge, we would say inside of maritime uh, areas. Another one is the harsh weather conditions, wind, waves, right? Out in the open sea, right? And these are frequently changing as well, right? And they change a bit more dramatically uh, on the sea, right? Another, issue that we have is that we're way out to sea sometimes in the maritime and ocean economies. So we're talking about limited internet connectivity, right? Hence the, 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 the counterbalancing trend for that is that we've got more optical navigation. So we rely less on GPS, for example, we can rely more on optics, right? So the, so the drone can read its surroundings. However, when you're out to sea, Right, it, it, there's not a lot of landmarks that you can use to navigate optically around, right? And that's uh, tied to this distance from infrastructure, charging infrastructure and such um, that we'll come back to in a, in a little while. And we've got um, often requirements for transnational political cooperation because we are in these shared sea basins, for example. So there's also, also that in these maritime uh, specific applications. So, but on the bright side, right? These challenges also provide opportunities. And where do we see those? We see that in, in the opportunities for patents. When we're, able, when we're able to solve these types of problems right, and get a little closer, there are patent opportunities that come from these advanced level, say, solutions. Good. Now, the next segment that we're going to do in this presentation is going to go through uh, a number of drone forecasts for applications, right? But I, I would just kind of harken back to Tia for a minute. If she's still around, maybe we can uh, kind of open it up and hear if there's any questions going on until if at this point, I want to hear from you if we've got anything that we want or need to be addressed. Actually, there's uh, no questions coming in right now. So Super. I guess people are just uh, still enjoying. Good, so far so good then. Okay, so let's let's then move on. And if you do have questions, please drop them into the chat bubble. We're gonna do drones on ships next. So drones on ships. So our first one is called the multi-purpose drone on a ship, right? We talked about this one in my last tidbit, just, a, just for a little bit. Now, um, there are certainly development projects happening in this space, right? So um, essentially this, these, this slide is, is something of a template slide that gives us our forecast, right? So in this one, we've got 2025 as being the median guess. So that means half of the guesses when people think about how many years into the future is this gonna happen, right? Half of them are guessing above 2025 and half of them are guessing below 2025. And you can see that here in this thickly dotted line here, right? And so these are the quartiles, right? These are, this is what we call a violin plot, right? And this is a, similar to what we would, might call a box plot or a box, box and whisker plot, right? But this shows the distribution of the guesses in these forecasts, right? So that's where people are guessing. Um, we've got a, a mode. So the most popular guess was then at 2025, right? With a mean at uh, November of 2026, right? So we took this uh, again, in in the year in last year and last no, November as well. So we've got a, an average of being November of 2026. Now, um, the average standard, standard deviation in these forecasts indicates how distributed. What's the tail 
essentially look like on the forecast, right? So it'll kind of give you an indication of how 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 spread, and that will be also reflected in the shape of these plots. And we'll see a lot of different types of plots as we go through here. Four percent of the people or respondents uh, have told us that multi-purpose drones and ships are already here, right? And four percent of the people who responded said it's never going to happen, right? And these have an average of uh, 23 respondents per per survey, right? Now this one's primarily about. Uh, maritime navigation at the end of the day. So the multi-purpose is a bit of, it's kind of misleading when we ask this one, um, but we do have a nice status update that we've got uh, here on, on multi-purpose drones on ships. I'm gonna show you some clips from what, we, what we've got here. So this is a clip from our friends up at Optico. Let's see if I can turn the volume down on my end anyway. It's, So Optico is uh, developing a, a, a navigation support drone that can then find the corners of the vessel as it's coming into port, right? And so that it's it's offering it an ability and it's offering this captain this kind of bird's eye view that they'd never been able to have before, right? To be able to to be able to navigate, right? And so we've got um, he, let's pause this. One. We've got another one here about how it's using, say, what we would call semantic segmentation to understand and read what it is that uh, is around uh, these vessels, right? So it's able to kind of, again, like you do in the CAPTCHA, right, where you say, okay, that looks like a, a stoplight, right? It's using that same kind of semantic segmentation to identify what it is and how close it is, it's getting, right? So that is uh, essentially our status update on uh navigation drones okay so then we've got uh, ice thickness measurement drones would be our next application and it's still playing in the background i don't know if you can hear this or not but i can hear it okay hold on a sec okay okay um next one is ice thickness measurement drones right so uh these drones are used or conceptualized to be able to say in this one is particularly it's it's tethered to the front of the vessel that's going through one of the northern sea routes and my powerpoint just went down sorry about that it's restarting mm -hmm. okay um Okay, so ice thickness, thickness measurement drones. Uh, da, 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 da. My apologies for the technical difficulty there. One moment, please. Okay. Okay, so, you, you, so this one's about getting these drones out in front of the the vessels that are going through the northern sea route right uh, and being able to figure out is this passable can we get through this ice how thick is it right there's also really quite interesting uh, offshoots for something like this for climate research right um we can cut off uh, as much as 40 percent off of traditional transit routes if we're able to pull this off right you see that we've got a median year of 2025 and a half that means half of the people think it's going to happen 26 or behind or half and half the people think it's going to happen at 25 and below right so here we go and then you see that there's a much kind of we'll call it a tail if you like uh moving out to the right hand side here 13% of respondents, that's a high response rate of thinking that it's already here. So be love to hear um, different types of opinions on, on what that is, right? What is it that we're, these respondents are meaning when this kind of uh, concept is already here? Good. Um, the next one we've got is this, what we would call the man overboard rescue drones. So again, we're still on drones on ships here. And so, um, in between 2011 and 2018, 92 out of 298 people who fell overboard in EU waters died, right? So we've got a high casualty rate uh, coming off of, let's say, row row vessels and cruise ships, but this is also, say, all ships kind of considered, right? Um, and they have a, it's often a very large turning radius, which gives them 
a much lower incentive to say turn around and go look for people in the water, especially especially on larger ships, right? Um, and so man overboard rescue drones, the idea would be that somebody falls overboard, maybe they trip a laser or maybe somebody reports it and it gets word back to the captain and the captain's able to smash the response button, right? And the drones go out the back of the vessel and they're going out to try to find uh, this person in the water, right? Um, so market here, I, I, this is one of the ones that I think there's a really cool market here. And uh, we've got a median date again at 2025, right? With the mode being at 2030, that means the most guesses are actually out here in, in, in 2030, right? Nobody thinks it's here and 3% think it'll never happen. We do see if we can't get a status update on the man overboard rescue drones. Let's see here, one moment. Yes. Nope. Next one. Nope. Mm, sorry. Let's see if I can find this here. I think it's back. So here we go. So here's some, uh, what they would say, imaging of what's happening in the water here. Right, and you can see that the subject has, is being able to be detected, right? So the heat signal, right, is being detected off of the back of the, the drone. It's pretty high um, in the air. And then, right, but uh, it's, that's kind of the status. We're able to start detecting people in the water. But again, there are some um, issues with, let's say, uh, the ability to drop things in the water, for example. So. How easy is it then to drop a flotation device, right? It's probably a lot easier said than done, but that's kind of where we're at with man overboard rescue drones in, the, in their current development that we know of. All right, now um, those are drones based on vessels, right? The vessels, these vessels have, let's say uh, their own power source that can be used then to charge a lot of those drones while they're on board. But there are some other places that, uh, in, in vessel uh, places where we need to try to get charging stations involved, right? So for example, at wind parks, right? So um, operating and maintaining these wind turbines, right? And the inspection of these wind turbines is, is quite uh, intensive, amounting to 25 to 30% of the total life cycle costs, right? So. The question isn't here about drones per se, but when will we have drone stations, right, installed at those wind parks so that the drones can then be, what we say in this one is be remotely operated, right, or semi-remotely operated in order to perform inspections. Again, uh, 2025, we see that we've got a big bulk here. And a lot of these drone uh, opportunities do look like they're moving pretty good. Uh, and that's why, uh, in the title of this talk, right, it said that, look, a lot of what's going to happen in drones is expected to happen in the next five years. 4% of the people think that's already here. Now, this is going to be quite higher when we get to oil and gas platforms and drone stations out there. So I'd love to hear about the drone stations uh, that are remotely operated at oil and gas uh, stations, if, you, if you've got information on that, right? But surprisingly, nobody, think that this will ne nobody thinks that it'll never happen. All right, so we've got, uh, let's see, we've got another video coming in here of, let's see, of what we would say, the, the development of a drone station as we see it. So this is a company again called Optico. Uh, and there we have on the right hand side, here is uh, the, the drone inside the station and the, and the and here it is then being moved into position, right? So this is kind of the way that uh, the, the drone stations are shaping up at this point, right? As, it, as they kind of get ready to be released into the wild and then it raises, right, itself.
So drone stations. Here's another, here's the drone station and oil and gas platforms. Now look at this violin plot here. Um, here, compared that to this one here, right? Where you've got all the respondents kind of before 2025 and we've got a much thinner, much longer kind of band, right? With 27% of the people thinking that this one's already here, a mode date, meaning that most people guessed that it already happened by 2020, right? With a median date in 2022. I don't have any, I don't have any empirical evidence on this happening, right? But then you've got this kind of a long tail, which means that there is a lot of guesses that are kind of stretched out in the, into the future. So wind parks and oil and gas platforms. We'll also see drone stations on board ships as well. And then we've got another category of drone, um, more based on the application rather than on, you know, where they are or how they're being charged. And we call this drones for ship ins inspection. And the first one that we have here is called the weld inspection drone, right? This is primarily for shipyards. So we've got some researchers at Aarhus University working on these in shipyard inspections, right? And so there's all, they've come across and, and managed to overcome a lot of the problems that you have with the say the internal compasses because of all the metal in the shipyard, right? It kind of messes with uh, these the drones ability to say uh, uh, operate properly. But welding is a critical function in shipyards, if not the critical function, right? Um, and with hundreds of kilometers of welds on board a boat or on a ship, right? So um, getting up into these very hard to reach places, right? To make those inspections happen, right? Which means that a lot of these drones will have to carry often special equipment, right? And to be able to perform these kinds of uh, inspections, right? Uh, it's not just an optical inspection that they're doing here. Anyway, we've got this, we've got nobody thinking it's gonna happen after 2035, which means that the, it seems like the all of the respondents think that it's, it's a likelihood if it is going to happen, and nobody thinks it's never going to happen. Twenty percent thinking that it's already here. Again, that's pretty high, right? But we've got then uh, a bimodal distribution, which means that we've got the same number of people in 2020 and the same number of people in 2025 thinking that it's going to happen, right? With the median at, at 2025. And next one, we've got um, we've got some flapping wing drones here coming into the game, right? We've got cruise ship inspection swarms. So when will we use swarms of drones, probably small drones, each with their own camera? and be able to release this and be able to perform a, a cruise ship inspection, All right? We've got median dates, uh, 2025 and a mode of 2025, right? There are some demonstration projects that you can find on the internet, I think coming out of MIT about drone, uh, drone swarms, right? Their ability to coordinate effectively, right? And find each other and understand where each other is, right? 19% um, saying that we're already performing cruise inspections with, with drones, and then 10% thinking that it's never going to happen. Um, and then we've got one uh, called drones for enclosed space inspection. So a lot of the ballast uh, tanks, right, and the cargo holds, right, will need to be inspected because they're often loaded, unloaded with, uh, say, material that can then corrode the in insides of these different uh, tanks. And so when will we be able to send in the drone to do the inspections, right? It's very harmful for humans. People die every year, right? Performing these kinds of inspections because of uh, depleted oxygen levels inside of there. Um, we've got, again, median of 2026 and a mode of 2025, but I think we're quite close to this. Here's another video coming from a company called RIMS um, in, in Holland. I can't really see it here. So here they are with their drone performing a, an inspection in an enclosed space. Let's see if we can jump a little forward. There's a nice scene I wanna kind of get you to. There it is.
but again, a lot of these types of inspections uh, may require, right, advanced uh, sensors to be able to perform those inspections, right? But it doesn't mean that we're on the, not on the doorstep of something like that with this already median uh, thinking that it's in, gonna happen in 2026. Next group we've got uh, is what we call drones in ports, right? So we've got uh, document delivery drones, right? This probably started back when Maersk delivered that box of cookies to that stationed oil tanker. Um, Port of Rotterdam then sent one out here uh, in last year in, in 2020, right? Actually performed a, a shore to ship delivery right to be able to get these documents now uh we've heard also in workshops that there's more people that think this will never happen because of the advancements of let's say the uptake and the hype around blockchain in 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 over the last year so this is uh again uh would need calibration uh to take into those kinds of but williamson shipserve estimates that this could be a potentially 675 million dollar per year market, right, for document delivery, instead of, instead of having to send out the launch boats to pick those documents up. Uh, yeah, Let's see here, we've got a video on this one. Here we go, here's, nope, here we go. So here's a, here's a video of this uh, drone in Rotterdam, drop in a package on a helipad. Right, and here we've got uh, more advanced uh, functionality coming in. Again, from our friends in Optico, right, where they're able to drop it into the basket from a height still, instead of getting real close to the ground. Okay, and let's see. So we've got then our document delivery drones, right? Kind of on the doorstep, uh, but we'll see where that ends up uh, going because I think it would have been a different answer if we uh, asked people to respond to, and we have seen this in other uh, projects where if we ask people to respond to something like delivering small packages, it makes a big difference, right? So we'll see what happens there with the transportation here in the future. And then we've got kind of a long shot one, right? Here's container lashing drones, like aerial drones really to perform lashing operations. There's a lot of work being done also in robots, right? Which probably kind of pushes this median out to this 2030 date, right? To be able to, to do this, right? And, and so in a mode also at 2030, right? So you see this distribution kind of sitting quite heavily a decade into the future. People think it's going to happen or it's never going to ha happen. It's already here. It's not already here, but it, nobody answered that they think it's already going to, it's never going to happen. Time will tell. And then we've got another one, right? Container stra stacking drones. This is drones and ports again, right? Imagine that you can use, uh, <laughs> it's either a helicopter sized drone, or maybe it's an array of multiple uh, heavy lifting drones. Now we know Heavy lifting drones at least last year could lift up to 200 kilos, right? Which is human weight plus some, right? So we know we can do 200 kilos. We know that there's prototypes about quadcopter drones or they're octo or 16 even, right? That can lift about a half a ton, right? But here for an empty container, right? Or a full container, we're talking, you know, uh, we're beyond a ton, right? So 2,000 kilos for an empty an empty container, right? So we've got this being pushed out in the future, right? That feasibility is just not on our doorstep right now. So medians and modes in 2030, right? With 4% of the people thinking that it's never going to happen. And then I got, uh, we've got a few uh, on, on wind park drones, right? So we had the charging station at the wind uh, park before, and that one kind of comes before these ones, right? So it makes sense that that's an earlier estimate than the 2025, but the blade cleaning drones, right? So these uh, blade, blades need to be cleaned periodically, right, on these wind turbines. Right, um, and it's, they lose a lot of money uh, if they're not there. We've got a status here from a company in Lithuania, Latvia, Latvia, 
right? Where they built this, uh, they'll show it later, but here's a, a blade cleaning drone. It's, it's tethered then, right? It was actually built for this kind of extreme sport of drone, I don't know what you would call that, drone dropping, drone jumping, but yeah. Yeah, okay. So we'll see that uh, extreme conditions and purposes can often lead to these uh, kind of other types of applications, right? So that's uh, our turbine blade cleaning drones. 2025 seems to be a pretty good guess in that one. 8% um, never going to happen, saying that uh, you know new materials will come out in the future where we won't have to clean those blades. But what about all the blades that have been installed that do still need cleaning, right? When we're talking you know tens of thousands of blades that still need to be cleaned. And then not a not a not a big jump away from those blade cleaning drones, right? Is the de-icing of the the wind turbine blades, right? We saw this big problem in Texas, um, where the cold weather really kind of shut down uh, a lot of their electricity production. Now here in the North Sea region, right, we're kind of they're kind of built for ice, so it's already taken into consideration in their design. But they still need to be de-iced, and they currently do this by helicopter, right? And they go over and dump this uh, you know, de-icing solution on these, on these blades. A lot of people think this is never gonna happen, right? So they are retrofitting a lot of these blades with heating coils. So they'll take them down and either retrofit or in the future, right? They've thought about like even being able to print circuits on them, heating coils right onto them. Median 2027, mode of 2030. And then we've got to, more further into the future is when will these robots have that dexterity? And this is talking about being able to torque a screw, right? It seems like a quite simple operation for a human hand, but for a drone, that's another question, right? So we add on this equipment, right? And these applications then get pushed out by our raiders uh, further into the future. And then we've got uh, a last one here on bird abatement drones for aquaculture. So these these birds eat tons of small fish inside of these aquaculture farms. How do you keep them away? Drones have been posed as a potential solution to do that. You can equip them with either noise makers or flamethrowers or what have you, right? But um, a lot of the pushback um, from these in the responses were about, you know, are you really gonna be able to say target birds with a drone. So there's a lot of uh, interesting commentary about regulatory authority and, and stuff that could really block something like this from happening. Um, running out of time, but real quick. Um, so you'll see that a lot of the other things that we've also taken a look at and we see applications for, right? Many of these are uh, say public sector or government sector um, shipyard delivery drones, so moving things in inventory around the warehouse. Our friends at Eco Prodigy has, has been looking at that one. And also uh, the ability to send drones over periodically in the shipbuilding process to take a layered kind of twinning approach, right? So you can twin the vessel as it's being built in, in, in the shipyard. Few words of caution when working with forecasts, right? These look at the North Sea region. It doesn't really look too much into what's going on in the rest of the world. So there could be developments that we've missed and overseen. And again, information is displaced in the heads of everybody. So you can't spot it all for sure. But forecasts, uh, these are a good starting point for discussion. They're not an end in themselves, right? So again, these would be good and useful for a team to think about and work with, right? And uh, hit, ping me up if you're interested in looking at more into the comments of what uh, people and raiders had to say. And again, just because many believe it to be true does not make it true, right? The idea that um, we may predict it and in, in hoping to create the, the function of the self-fulfilling prophecy, but that not, is not necessarily always gonna be the case. There are gonna be rival technologies that can be able to perform and outperform these drone applications for sure. Um, and then again, innovators and organizations need to preserve optionality. And this is a very difficult problem that we've got with uh, a lot of the drone companies, right? When it is project to project, right? How do we then find the better use for this kind of application? Where are the markets so that we can grow these companies, right? And really get these, uh, these drone companies moving forward. And again, innovation never happens by themselves, right? It always takes a team and a group of people Right, dedicated to the to making that successful. 
Um, and so uh, at the end, it is, uh, we've got here at Aarhus University, you know, uh, lots of researchers that work in drones and robotics. So each of the ones listed here have probably 20 different research assistants and postdocs and PhD in their groups. So, you know, we're talking, we're in the hundreds of researchers that are looking across uh, solutions for drones and robotics. So please do reach out if you've got any uh, needs that you're looking into. And that's all I got. And it is 16 right now. So thank you very much for watching. Um, looking forward to any questions or comments that you have. Okay. Thank you so much, Matt. Well, I'm uh, totally surprised of what, what of the status of drones today. Um, and uh, it's talking very much into some articles I just read in Sufat about drones also for use for tank inspections right now. Uh, I think it's only a few days ago I read it. Um, but I, I can say that I know several guys at sea who is, uh, who is invested in a drone. And I don't know if it's uh, to help them with navigation and container lashings, or it's a question of boredom, but at least uh, it, it's keeping them entertained. Um, I guess that all ship officers they can use an extra hand on there. So, but um, for the participants, I'm sure that there are some questions. Um, so just send in your thoughts and questions. But uh, first of all, I would like to uh, ask a question myself, and it's about uh, trust and ethics. And uh, that's the never ending, to never -ending uh, topic on this. Do you think that we can trust this technique and, and, and what the, the drones that can tell us? Are they just as good as uh, the human eye? And uh, I mean, especially when it comes to navigation, uh, it is a nice tool, but but I still hope that navigators they will slow down the speed on the, on the vessel. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, they, they can only perform the tasks that we program them to do so far. I mean, they're, uh, you know, working with the the topic of the future, you know, and the whole idea that you know the, the machines can, you know, become aware of themselves, right? I I I. I guess I'll have to, we'll have to wait to see how that lands, but not really planning and worrying too much about that kind of stuff. Right now, there are issues, uh, certainly with like cybersecurity, right? If there is some really malicious kind of actors uh, like that with bad intents that that want to do bad things, right? So there's certainly, um, there's it's new hardware for for them to work with or to, to, to leverage against its original purpose. So there are, um, considerations to be taken into account there. Um, but I mean, there are dangers, right? If, uh, mentioned falling on people's heads, right? Uh, for example, in, over cities and stuff. But um, can you trust them to perform the task? <laughs> that takes testing. I think the testing will demonstrate then in the long run, you know, the, the reliability of these kinds of tasks being operated by drones and, and the equipment that they're carrying for that matter. Well, at least uh, for container lashings and uh, the inspections, <laughs> it would be such a nice tool to, to have out there. But I was thinking that wouldn't it need even more education for the seafarers? Is it the seafarers that are supposed to control and, uh, the drone? Or do you think that it would need extra staff on board to, to uh, control the drone for, for all these nice things that you present here? I mean, there's a big push right now coming from the, the drone developers to reduce the, the needs for human operators. So anytime they can reduce and eliminate tasks of the human operators, because they know that they're, the training that they get will never be sufficient as if they were actually building those drones and testing those drones. So the handoff of this type of equipment is very, very difficult to do. Right, so you will see a lot of, say, owner operators, right, providing services at least in the short run. Um, but as these systems say integrate and they, the the errors and the bugs are worked out of them over time, I think we'll see more button pushing, right, mm -hmm. and just um, easy interfaces where you ask it to do the task and it is able to perform that task that you want it to do with limited type of human manipulation, 
right? Like battery charging is a big one. We lose lots of drones just because the human operators haven't charged it sufficiently or they forgot to charge it entirely. So we lose then drones uh, all the time based on those kinds of things. And so the more we can automate, right? The better off we're gonna be. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to see it happen because I was just a little bit afraid that we put even more on the shoulders, especially on the offices out there. But uh, well, it is it is a nice tool. Um, so I, I, ha I have to ask you because from a, a researcher's point of view, what what do you think is the coolest and most likely technique where drones can actually help us in the maritime? Ah. Uh. Try not to choose sides, but I kind of, I kind of really like that uh, man overboard rescue drone one. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's now it's four years away, right? It's 2025, but I think, I think the market should be there. And even if these big, I mean, these big cruise, ships, I mean, don't want to say it, but these big cruise ships, they don't want to turn around for somebody in the water if they don't have to. If that person went overboard, you know, X number of minutes ago, mm -hmm. they consider them lost. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's um, um, I think it's a, I think it's I think there's a lot of benefit to be to be delivered to those kinds of, uh, say, services. If we're able to um, install systems that are ready to go right, almost a, a plug and play at, at some point where you'll have, you know, the ability to, you know, again, have the cap and hit the button and the drones go and perform their mission. I think that's just super cool. Yeah, I, that's yeah. one I <laughs> And especially with men overboard, I think there's no problem uh, to already use it now. I mean, it's just a, an, an extra couple of eyes. It's a, where it's important to have. Mm. Yeah. So we, um, mm. I'm with you on that one. But it takes a lot of development. It's, it's so much easier said than done. And so I, for, to all the drone developers out there, I hope I don't feel like I'm oversimplifying any of the work that you do. Yeah. Okay, but Matt, actually, there has come in some, uh, um, just some, um, some notes for you. It's uh, people that said they're saying that they had no idea that that we were so far with with the drones in the industry. And thank you for an insightful presentation. That is from Emma Gonson, who is an officer with the DFDS right now. Um, and there's a question from LM. How big is an how big of an issue? How big of an issues are winds for drones? Couldn't this be a critical aspect when operating on a nearby the ocean and possible? possibly be a source of time, material, and money loss. Yeah, and energy loss, right? So being able to maintain position in the wind, you know, really uh, draws out the, that battery capacity quite quickly. So then your your uptime or your work time is reduced quite severely, right? By, by heavy winds that need to say, maintain their position. Um, yeah, so it's it's time, material, and it's money. All right, when it comes to to that problem, um, and it's not an easy solution, and, and and I'm probably not the right person to ask, right? So, LM, get in touch with me, and I'll put you in touch with some of our our guys at the at the university who who yeah. work with that stuff on a daily basis. Yeah, actually, I know who LM is. It's a one of my colleagues from Malak who who asked this question, not, but I will uh, I will tell her to get in in touch with you, yeah, Matt. Okay, but if there's no more questions coming in, actually, I guess that we have reached the end or else uh, please say uh, come in with your questions and I will pass them over to Matt now. And if you're afraid to do it here in, a, in, a, in, in the chat, I will send out the contact details and Matt so you can, uh, you can get in touch with him afterwards. <clears throat> but uh, Matt, once again, a big thank you um, for your presentation and uh, thank you to all of you who listened along. So uh, tomorrow I'll send you an email with the with this uh, recording and the uh, contact information on Matt. Um, I hope that all of you, you are about to turn off your computer now and you will enjoy the rest of this Thursday afternoon. 
So on behalf of Malak, I would say thank you and see you soon. I don't know about you, Matt. Would you like to say something in the end? No, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Of course. Bye, everyone.